Good afternoon. I'd like to welcome everyone to the 100th Infantry Battalion Challenge. So nice for everyone to come and participate in this challenge and this kickoff event, um, especially to the mentors. Thank you for joining, volunteers, students, interested people. Uh, we love having you join us today. The purpose of the challenge is to perpetuate the stories and the legacy and the value that set the foundation for Hawaii's present and future based on the sacrifices of the soldiers of the 100th Infantry Battalion. At this time, I'd like to introduce Kathleen Hayashi, who will be introducing the stories of some of these great soldiers from the 100th Infantry Battalion. My name is Kathy Hayashi, and my father, you can see his photo there, is Tokuichi Hayashi, and he was a soldier in the 100th Infantry Battalion during World War II. I grew up in a plantation house in Aiea that overlooks Pearl Harbor and what is now known as the Arizona Memorial. The house is built in 1936, and it's only about two miles from the house to the shores of Pearl Harbor. You see a picture there of my grandfather and my grandmother on the Hayashi side. On December 7, 1941, my grandfather had just gotten up. It was about eight o'clock in the morning, and grandpa was sitting on his bed. Suddenly, he heard planes, and they saw planes with big red zeros painted on the sides and the wings of the plane as they, these planes flew over our home, diving down towards the U.S. battleships at Pearl Harbor with their machine guns blaring. These planes were flown by pilots from the empire of Japan. A stray bullet penetrated the roof of our house and hit my grandfather in the right hand. It actually went right through his hand and they had to take him to Leeward Hospital, which is now Palimomi Hospital. And my grandfather was born in Japan, but he spent most of his adult life in Hawaii working on the plantation. If he was sitting just six inches to the right, that bullet would have gone right into his head and he would have died immediately. Our homeland, Hawaii, was being attacked by the enemy, Japanese nationals that looked like Japanese Americans that were born in Hawaii. Shock, panic, hysteria hit our islands, the mainland, and the world. World War II was declared by America. Here in Hawaii, overnight, the Hawaii-born Japanese Americans became targets of fear, suspicion, and prejudice. Can you imagine how you would feel if your best friend stopped liking you just because you looked like the enemy? Two years before the bombing of Pearl Harbor, my father joined the racially mixed Hawaii National Guard. He was tasked to protect Hawaii and America by guarding the shorelines, like by Makapu, the mountains, vital installations from the feared Japanese invasion. If you ever walked up Cocoa Head Crater and those train tracks, that was a bunker up there to protect the islands from invasion by the Japanese. Six months after my, the bombing of Pearl Harbor, my father was one of 1,432 Hawaii-born Japanese Americans who were taken out of the multi ethnic National Guard unit and formed into a separate battalion due to the hysteria, 
after December 7th, the bombing of Pearl Harbor. These Japanese Americans were separated from their friends that were Hawaiian, Haole, Chinese, Filipino, and other minorities, and formed what would be known as the 100th Infantry Battalion Separate. The Japanese Americans were just not trusted because they looked like the enemy and they were watched very carefully. Even after they got shipped out of Hawaii on June 6, 1942, their fate and destination were unknown. They went on this SS Maui. They didn't even know where they were going. They left without any cheering crowds. They left without any fanfare. The 100th Battalion ended up at Wisconsin and Mississippi, Camp McCoy in Wisconsin and Camp Shelby in Mississippi. And after training, they were shipped overseas to Italy in September of 1930, 1943. And within a week, one week of entering the war, 200 battalion soldiers were already killed in action. Suddenly, the reality that, hey, you know, we could die here. It hit the 100 battalion soldiers, but they thought about the parting words from their parents when they left Hawaii, and that those words really pushed them on. Those words were, do not bring shame to the family, your country, yourself, don't bring shame, do your best and die if you must, but don't bring shame. In early January, 1944, the soldiers were ordered to attack a deserted mountaintop monastery known as Monte Cassino. It was occupied by the German enemy up on the top, giving them a clear view of the American soldiers as they attempted to ascend the mountain. From their vantage point, the American soldiers, including the 100th Battalion, were like sitting ducks just being shot at. Because of the large number of casualties sustained in battle, the men killed in action and others suffering serious life-threatening wounds, the 100th Battalion was nicknamed the Purple Heart Battalion. Purple Heart is awarded for sacrifice. Sacrifice to those who had been wounded or killed in combat. The casino battle really decimated the 100th, leaving it with only 300, 521 men to fight that were able and that was from the 1,300 men that originally landed in Italy, just five months. They went from 1,300 men to 521 able men that were able to fight. 100 Battalion continued to fight on as a separate unit until July 1944, when it, it, when it became the first battalion of the 442nd Regimental Combat Team, but they were allowed to keep its name, the 100th Infantry Battalion, because of their recognition of the unparalleled combat achievement that they had. They would normally be called the 1st Battalion of the 442, but the Army, the U.S. government said, no, you guys did so well. They, under the 100th Battalion crest, we get, we'll let you keep your name, 100th Infantry Battalion. They went on to earn many medals and citations for individual soldiers and also for the unit as a whole. Throughout their service in Europe, they continued to fight for freedom and to prove their loyalty to the United States of America. Upon returning to Hawaii after the war, the veterans got involved in politics and helped to plant the seeds 
for a more open and democratic society in government, business, education. And in time, these efforts working with like-minded people opened the doors of opportunity for all of us. I personally have benefited from all of their sacrifice. I worked for GTE and Verizon, both in Hawaii at Hawaiian Telephone Company and Verizon in Texas, Ohio, and Connecticut. And my last job, I was fortunate to retire as the Senior Vice President of Wholesale Markets, responsible for $11 billion of revenue. And I know that I was able to get these opportunities because of the sacrifices and accomplishments of the 100th Battalion. They opened doors of opportunity for me and you by leveling the playing field for all people. It was not an environment anymore in Hawaii of whites on the top and people of color on the bottom. We leveled the playing field because they took a stand to get involved in politics, in education, in any kind of leadership role to make a change. Like the Hokulea, the men of the 100th Battalion are Hawaii's heroes. Their unique story of sacrifice and perseverance is a Hawaii story. It belongs to the people of Hawaii Nei to learn and to share with others. But it only will live on if it is embraced by Hawaii's people and shared with succeeding generations in our island home. And that's why we're having this challenge to reach out to the young people and reach out to the community, people like us, to continue to keep their story alive. I sincerely hope that you will accept this challenge to pick a problem or an issue facing Hawaii and develop an innovative and creative solution using the values you learn about the 100th Battalion. Now we're gonna have a very special thing. We're gonna hear stories that were written by the 100th Battalion men. It, it's written in their hand and it's in a book called Japanese Eyes, American Heart. They, they will be read by professional storytellers. Although the voices are Dan and Nyla, these stories come straight from the heart and souls of the 100th Battalion soldiers. Please share these stories with your families and friends so we can all keep the legacy of the 100th Battalion alive forever. So with that, let's open the book and hear the stories of the 100th Battalion. Conrad Tsukuyama, 100th Infantry Battalion. I saw his face. On Saturday night, December 6th, I was at home on a weekend pass, telling my family what a soldier's life was like. Early Sunday morning during breakfast, we heard unusual activities at the Kanhiohe Naval Air Station. It was normally very quiet and peaceful on weekends, but that day, we heard explosion after explosion. We turned on the radio just in time to hear the radio announcer interrupt the morning program and repeat excitedly, this is the real McCoy, the Japanese are attacking Pearl Harbor. The family rushed out the door and there on December 7, 1941, I saw the face of that Japanese pilot. He looked calm and confident Maybe this was his way of displaying his arrogant superiority, or perhaps he was communicating to us not to worry that all would be okay. 
Mushrooming clouds rose above the hill that obstructed our view of the naval air station, which was only two air miles from where we stood. Judging by the black clouds of smoke now visible high above the hill, I concluded that extensive damage had been inflicted. The life of a simple country boy, a raw army recruit from a small village in Kailua, turned a new course that day. But I was not the only one. For December 7, 1941, affected every living soul in Hawaii. Many harsh words were directed at the pilots as one by one they passed from view. My anger was based on betrayal, the deepest hurt that can be inflicted. The deep-rooted respect and admiration of the Japanese instilled in us from childhood was shattered. They were mercilessly killing their own immigrant citizens. By this time, the radio was blaring that all military personnel were to return to their units immediately. Our anger and confusion subsided temporarily. We said our farewells, giving each other big emotional hugs, telling everyone to take good care of themselves. I assembled my military gear and, in uniform, was prepared to walk to my buddy's home when he drove up, eager and excited. I still remember Father's parting words. Be a good soldier. Mothers were those of a mother. Come home safe. Along the unimproved farm road, dust trailed the 1937 model Ford as we sped along, dodging potholes. Neighbors standing along the roadside waved farewell to us. Here I was, 24 days in the army, and in a few hours, a participant in the Pacific campaign. <laughs> the only war training or experience I had came from playing soldier in the cane fields as a child. My sisters and brothers, whom I had been impressing just the night before with the nomenclature, description, and demonstration of the U.S. Army gas mask, would have been mightily shocked if they knew that I didn't know how to load my Springfield 03 rifle with ammunition. Traffic heading toward Honolulu seemed normal for a weekend, but my mind began to race trying to understand why Japan had attacked us. Common talk among the Issei all through the years was that Japan's aggression in conquering other nations was to satisfy its need for more land for its growing population. The Sino-Japan War, for example, was an expansion for Japan, which was intended to also position Japan strategically for an eventual war with Russia. What I couldn't understand was why Japan had done this to the United States. <laughs> to put it mildly, I felt Japan had made its last mistake by irritating the world's mightiest power. As we headed north to Schofield Barracks, the traffic approaching Pearl Harbor indicated huge turmoil. As we began to climb up Red Hill through Moana Loa, we could actually see Pearl Harbor my heart began to beat out of control. Pearl Harbor was a scene of devastation. Black smoke belched forth from explosions. I could see the twisted metal frames of the harbor infrastructure and the bottoms of the capsized battleships. Pearl Harbor was literally on fire. Tokuji Ono, 100th Infantry Battalion, Dead silence. Most of us local guys were out on weekend pass. I had a bad tooth, so I had a dental appointment. Sunday morning, mind you. It must have been a 7.30 appointment. The dentist's office, uh, I think it was one of the Hayashi brothers, was right around Smith and Hotel Streets. I got out of the office about 8 o'clock. As I walked to the bus stop back to Kalihi, I heard all the emergency vehicles blasting their sirens and rushing toward West Oahu. Between the low buildings, I could see some dark smoke. Everything was heavy and black. I thought it was an industrial fire, so 
I thought nothing of it. I got on the bus. The bus driver did not know what was going on. By that time, most of the emergency vehicles must have gone out to Pearl Harbor because I didn't see any more. So I just went home. As soon as I got there, my older brother told me that I'd better listen to the radio. The announcer was repeating over and over again something to the effect that the United States was at war with Japan. I remember, he said, all military personnel must report to your base. That meant guys like me, even though I was in civilian clothes. In those days, it was still peacetime, so as soon as you got home, you took off your uniform and wore your civvies, or civilian clothes. Now, I took off my civvies and put on my uniform. I had to go back into town because the buses going to the different military installations all started from the old Armed Forces YMCA. In a sense, I accepted the fact that the radio announcement was correct, that war was declared. But I hadn't heard or seen anything in or around Pearl Harbor, so the idea of war seemed far-fetched. So I went casually, like so many others, I'm sure, to the Y to wait for the bus. Most of the guys there, the GIs, the sailors, weren't really aware of what had happened. There were two major thoughts. One was that it was a mock battle being put on, a training exercise meant to look realistic. The other was that somebody was filming a Pearl Harbor movie trying to inject all the realism they could into it. Both scenarios made sense. By that time, it was well after eight o'clock and all the bombing had stopped. But we saw one Japanese plane flying over the city, pretty low. You could see the Hinomaru, the red circle, the rising sun on the plane. I swear we could see the pilot. He didn't do any strafing or drop a bomb, so I thought, this can't be war. I think of war as bombs exploding here and there, and none of that happened to those of us who were around at that time. We got on our buses. I remember the next sequence of events vividly. While going out to Schofield, I think most of us were draftees, but there were a few regular army people. We just talked to each other because it was a long ride. The conversation, as I recall, was very light. You know, guys saying they had a big party last night and something about drinking a lot. And some guy had a nice date with his girlfriend. Everything was upbeat, light and merry. As we approached Pearl Harbor, we saw all the smoke rising. When we came right up to Pearl Harbor, we could see the half sunken ships and what was left of some sunken ships and all the damage, the planes in the water, smoke coming up. Everyone just looked stunned. I guess each one of us knew without having it confirmed by the others that this couldn't be a mock battle or a movie, no matter how realistic. This was the real thing. For several seconds, there was just dead silence in the bus. Then, as we rode away from Pearl Harbor, the conversation started coming back again, but the tone was entirely different. Guys asking each other, hey, you married? You get children, you get family, or things of that sort. It was more subdued, serious. I can't recall what I talked about. <laughs> Maybe I didn't say anything. There was a complete turnaround in the atmosphere and subject matter. I remember that to this day. Seiso Kamishita, 100th Infantry Battalion. Honor thy country. I want to share with you a true story about something that happened to me in my own home. Many would find it hard to believe. One day, while on my first pass since securing the islands, I went home to visit my family in Waimea. I was met at the kitchen steps by my mom and dad who were waiting for me. Their heads were bowed and they were holding hands. I was 
taken aback because in all my years growing up, I had never seen my parents holding hands. I didn't know what to make of it. My mother spoke first. Say so. Father and I have something to ask you. What is it? I asked. My mother continued without hesitation. You are American soldier. Your country is America, a wonderful country. Our country, Japan, attack your country. That make us your mem and that make us your enemy. If you feel that it is your duty as an American soldier to shoot us, we will be proud of you. I was totally flabbergasted. Bakatare, I shouted. If both of you had intended to kill me, then yeah, I would shoot you. They thanked me and asked me what they could do. My request to them was simple. Just obey and do whatever my government asks you to do. My dad finally spoke. Say so. As American soldier, you must not bring shame to your country, yourself, or your family. Do your best, even if you must give your life. He said, in conclusion, that a true Japanese would give his life to the country of his birth. With these formalities over, we sat down for the dinner my mother had prepared. I was just about to tell them about the Japanese submarine at Nawili Wili when my mother interrupted me. She cautioned me not to tell them anything. She said that in case they were interned and questioned, they would have nothing to say. The less they knew, the better. They would have nothing to hide or to tell when they were interrogated. In retrospect, I believe my parents were smart, obedient, and very cooperative. Mike N. Tokunaga, 100th Infantry Battalion, Building Behind the Scenes. In June of 1942, all of the Japanese boys were told to report to Camp Paukukalo. When we reported to the camp, they told us that they were going to form the 100th Infantry Battalion as a separate unit. We were shipped to Schofield Barracks to form the 100th Infantry Battalion. Many of the draftees were members of the Asahi's baseball team. Consequently, when we went to Camp McCoy in Wisconsin, we had a pretty good baseball team because so many of the Asahi's players were on our team. Going down to Mississippi was a cultural shock. On my first pass, Jimmy Yoshida and I went to a theater in Hattiesburg, which was a small town. A black girl said, you all buy a ticket on the other side. That's when I realized that we weren't considered black. So I went over to the other side where the Howley girl was selling tickets and bought our tickets from her. When we started going up the stairway, the head usher called us and said, you can't go up there. Why? I asked. That's in heaven. That's only for ends. I was 22 years old, and that was the first time in my life that I realized what in heaven meant. When I went downstairs, I looked upstairs at the balcony. All I could see were black faces. Another incident happened in New Orleans. There were always two lines at the bus stop, one for blacks and one for whites. I was the first guy in the white line catching the bus back to Camp Shelby. An old black woman, she must have been about 70 or 80 years old, was standing in the black line. When the bus stopped and the door opened in front of her, she tried to get on. The bus driver, who was white, came out and pushed her to the ground. Let the other white people on first, he said. 
I grabbed that bus driver by the shirt, dragged him out of the bus. Six of us kicked the hell out of him for knocking that poor black woman to the ground. Sakai Takahashi, 100th Infantry Battalion. We loved our country. It's hard to describe what it was like to be in combat. Everybody's scared, but you've got to move forward. You've got to overcome that fear. Once you start moving, you build up courage. The worst time is when you're sitting still and waiting, because that's when you start reflecting on what might happen and your fear of getting wounded or killed comes out. It's an awesome feeling, but you can overcome it. Once you start moving, especially if you're successfully moving forward, that fear gives way to the real fighting spirit. You want to go ahead and get it done with. The 100 and 442nd suffered lots of casualties. Some people said we were expendable, that we were like cannon fodder. I don't believe that. We just didn't have enough troops. We could have been much more successful, for instance, if the 100th had been the size of the 442nd, 3,000 troops. But we were only 1,300. They used us because we were successful. We were good fighters. All the generals can attest to that. They could trust us. And the more fighting you get involved in, the more casualties you're going to suffer. By the time we reached Casino, my company's strength was down to only 46 men out of an initial authorized strength of 190. Most of them were casualties, killed or wounded. Uh, not too many were killed, but enough of them were. Most were wounded. In my own personal experience, I've known discrimination, but I ignored it. There was an instance when I was on duty on the island of Kauai before I joined the 100th. The 27th Division, a New York National Guard unit, had been shipped out to Hawaii. One of its regiments was deployed to Kauai. There was a General Michael Anderson who issued a general order saying that the Nisei in the service could not visit their parents unless their parents were American citizens. We completely ignored the order because we felt that this guy was a stupid general. If we got caught, we got caught. But we weren't going to ignore our parents just because this guy from New York had this bias. If I could leave anything for future generations in terms of the experience of the 100th, I would want them to know that we fought for the United States because we loved our country. We were born and raised here. We were taught what democracy is, what it is to be American. We participated like other soldiers. We grumbled because of the discomforts and the things that we suffered, but we fought for our country because we were loyal to our country. We also knew that there was a lot of discrimination, not only against the Japanese people, but against other racial groups as well. One of the ways we could mitigate or reduce discrimination was to show people that we were as good as any other American. If need be, we'd fight again. I hope future generations feel the same way. Katsumi Dak Kometani, 100th Infantry Battalion. Letters from the Front. Letters Home. December 19, 1943. Dearest Mom, and I should note here that if you read a lot of these letters, Mom is not his mother. He refers to his wife as Mom, and he refers to himself as Dad. My dearest Mom, often wonder that it is going to be a sad Christmas and New Year's at many homes. But when you consider the existing conditions and the deeds of our boys, we still have many things to be thankful for. Whatever you do, don't worry, as we are not taking this life as a matter of course 
and are doing our share. Mrs. Joe Takata wrote to me a very nice letter and thanked me, but certainly I have done so little that it should be forgotten. I'm dropping her a line soon. We are now resting and taking it easy and the boys are relaxing. It's good to feel this way. Miss you and the children, especially Carol, who is growing up and is probably at the cutest time. Imagine, she won't remember her daddy's face when I get home. But I hope I don't spoil her. Love to you all, Daddy. October 6, 1943. My dearest mom, just to let you know that we are all well and today resting after a strenuous week. This is the greatest experience any man can have. And instead of the feeling that perhaps we were in the wrong era of hardships and conflicts, maybe it is a privilege that only comes to a certain generation. Especially, it is a test for us to be able to give to our country when it really needs manpower. Love, Daddy. November 25th, 1943. From somewhere in Italy, to you, a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. My dear Carol, Jimmy, and Frankie boy. In about a month and a half, Christmas and New Year's will be here. This is the second Christmas and New Year's away from all of you. I miss you all, and I know you miss me too. But somewhere in Italy, a job must be done and I am here doing my share, not only for my country, but for all of you. When this letter and greeting reaches you, remember that there are many thousands of our boys away from our home, just like Daddy, fighting for our country. They're doing a good job. Remember all of them in your prayers. It is my sincere hope that when the next holiday season comes, we will be all together as one big happy family. Until then, be good and help mama more than ever. Take care of your health, be good to others. Please give Uncle John and his family and Baba-san and Ji-san and Fujisue and his family, Uncle Kotogi and our family, my greetings. Take care of mom and you all give my greetings to her. Love you all. Daddy. Huni no tameni, for the sake of the country, by Kikuyo Fujimoto. Many people have asked me how I felt to send my two sons to war. My response is always the same. Huni no tameni, for the sake of the country. My husband, Hikosuke Fujimoto, worked as a steward for Queen Liliuokalani, so for a time we lived at Washington Place and later at Paoakalani, the Queen's summer residence in Waikiki. There were about, oh, eleven or twelve boys from the Waikiki area who went to war. I remember some of the family names, Nakamura, Takashige, Hikida, Kawasaki, Komori, and um, Nadamoto. Even though quite a few of our sons had gone to war, my husband and I never talked about it with the other parents. You have to remember, this was just after the bombing of Pearl Harbor, so people still looked at us as if we were spies. We never got together to talk in groups. I wasn't angry about that. Shikata ganai. It cannot be helped. Japan bombed Pearl Harbor. Funio, my second child, and the eldest of my two sons, I had to accept his having to go to war with the 100th Infantry Battalion. 
my younger son, Hikoso, who is two years younger than Kunio, later volunteered for the 442nd. I had to let them go for the sake of our country. Yes, I worried about them. Every day I sat in front of our Butsudang and prayed that they would remain healthy and safe. After Kunio left Hawaii for the mainland, I was able to get a message to him. I told him to take care of himself and to do his best. Kunio was injured at Hill 600 in Italy and was finally sent home in June 1944 after the 100th Battalion pulled back from Cassina. When he arrived in Hawaii, the war was still on. I'm glad he returned home safe, but I know also that we had an obligation to the United States of America. I had a Japanese spirit. After all, I was born in Japan in 1898, but America has been good to my family. Things happen in life, and we just have to accept them. I never ever thought that my children should fight for Japan because my husband and I came from Japan or because my boys were of Japanese ancestry. I gave my children to America, so I had no claim to them. By the grace of God, they came home. I sincerely hope you will not have to endure the same experiences we encountered during the war. Let us all hope, pray, and strive for world peace on earth. You've just heard from a mother who shared from her heart how she felt about sending her two sons off to war, as well as from a few men who fought with the 100th Infantry Battalion, from the bombing of Pearl Harbor, to their training on the mainland, to their time in Italy. You heard them speak of missing Hawaii, their love for the country, America, and their families sacrifice, perseverance, moral courage, bravery, desire for peace, standing up against racism and prejudice and for what they believed was right, and never giving up. In your research, you'll likely come across other values. After experiencing the war, you would think that life would be a piece of cake when the men returned home. But you have to understand that during the 1940s and 1950s, Japanese Americans and other people of color were considered second-class citizens. They returned to Hawaii with a plantation system that had not changed. Whites only in leadership and most people of color as the manual laborers they were determined to change that. They persevered, they worked hard, they bonded together, they did not give up. Some went into politics and changed the political, social, and economic climate of Hawaii. Some were successful in opening businesses, businesses that you may have heard of, such as Central Pacific Bank. Rainbow Drive-In, Petman, House of Photography, Kuroda Auto Repair, Valley Isle Cleaners on Maui, Cafe 100 and Kadulta Brothers on Hawaii Island. Times Market was started by 100th veteran Wallace Turia and his brother Albert in honor of their youngest brother, Herman Turia. It was Herman's dream 
to open a supermarket when he returned home. He was killed in action. If you go to Times Kahala, you'll see the plaque just outside the store honoring him. My name is Jan Sakota. Growing up, I learned from my father, Gary Uchida, and his war buddies that courage, sacrifice, and determination, and not giving up did not end with the 100th Infantry Battalion soldiers. It continued on with them as civilians. We need to continue practicing these character values and instill them in this, your generation, and succeeding generations. Think of how you will tackle major challenges in your life. Challenge yourself, just like the Hawaiian, just like the 100th Infantry, Infantry Battalions chose to do. Why is it important for you to take this challenge? Lynn Cross, war correspondent who covered the 100th Battalion and later the 442nd Regimental Combat Team wrote, as years pass, statistics of decorations and the numbers of men killed and wounded may be forgotten. But the record of that original 100th Infantry Battalion and what it meant in the acceptance of Japanese Americans as loyal citizens of the, of the United States must be remembered. If it had failed in its first months of fighting in Italy, there might have never been a chance for other Americans of Japanese ancestry to show their loyalty to the United States. As convincingly, convincingly as they did on the battlefields of Europe. The 100th had proved that loyalty to the United States is not a matter of race or ancestry, and it had set an example for people of all nations who seek sanctuary here to fight for those values and concepts of government which have made the United States a refuge from the hunger and despair which haunts so much of the world. And so we hope you will take up this challenge of identifying at identifying a problem facing Hawaii and come up with an innovative solution by applying the values, sacrifices, contributions, and accomplish, accomplishments of the 100th Infantry Battalion both during and after the war. We'd like to take this opportunity to thank Stuart Yamani of Stuart Yamani Creative. Naila Fuji Bab and Dan Seki, both storytellers. We thank the 100th Infantry Battalion Veterans Organization and the, Veter and the Nisei Veterans Legacy for their support. Also to Sheila B, Sherilyn Lau, Wendell Tashiro, resource educators who have been an immense help. Now I'm turning you over, Sheila, to tell you about the challenge. Uh -huh. What you've just experienced is just the tip of the iceberg, and I hope it has proved, provided you a sense of pride towards the brave men of the 100th Infantry Battalion. As a way to continue their legacy, now and into the future, this challenge was born. And we are so glad that you are here thinking about joining us on this journey. Aloha, I'm Sheila Bukajar one of your two challenge coordinators. You've already met Ms. Sherilyn Lau earlier in the meeting. She is also another coordinator. So the next part of tonight's meeting is to provide you with the highlights and a glimpse of where you will find the resources for the challenge. What I wanted to start with was the challenge statement that will guide you through this entire project. First, you will be asked to identify an important issue or problem that your community faces. This, we hope, will be guided by your own passions. Second, as your passion will trigger what you focus on as an important issue or problem, your growing knowledge about the 100th Infantry Battalion and the values, the sacrifices, contributions, and accomplishments of its soldiers and veterans will inform your creativity, 
in developing your solutions, ideas, and or innovation. Third, as a way to put a voice to your thoughts, ideas, and solution, you will be required to present them to the organizers at the end of the challenge. We hope you'll see the challenge will allow you to incorporate your passion and the legacy of the 100th Infantry Battalion soldiers and veterans to solve a current community problem or issue. Here are some of the basic information to get started. The challenge is open to all middle and high school students. You can participate as an individual, as part of a team, a class, or an organization. You will have to sign up for the challenge via an Eventbrite registration. We are asking all participants and potential participants to register by March 29th, if at all possible. Later registrations will be accepted on a case-by-case -case basis. A permission and media approval form will also be required. In addition to the basic information, we would also like you to understand the expectations and outcomes of the challenge. There will be three outcomes you should expect to complete. The first is the research form which will be handed in with your solution. The second is your actual solution or innovation. The third requirement is a presentation of your project. Some of the types of outcomes or products that you could, could be accepted for the challenge are videos, business ideas, websites, art pieces, or a poem or a story. I would like to really stress that your solution, your completed project, is only limited by your creativity and imagination. Your guidance should come from the challenge statement itself. And the question you should ask yourself is, does your solution, your innovation, your piece of art, address a problem or issue in Hawaii? And how has your passion and the hundredth informed it. So as you can see, the sky's the limit. As with any type of journey, the challenge has an estimated timeline. Pro probably the most important is when to submit your work, which is the week of May 9th, and when you'll be expected to present your work, which is the week of May 16th. Now that you've gotten a glimpse of the basic information about the challenge. Here's, here is one website that you will be able to visit to find out about the historical and background links as well as challenge guidance and, and um, templates. This website will be your connection to all things challenge. Now that I'd like to take just a couple of minutes to point out what you will find on these websites, the page that you'll want to navigate to from onepukapukavets.org is to the challenge part in the navigation bar in the website. On this top page, you will find buttons link or links to both the historical information page and documents and the challenge information page and documents. As you click on the battalion resource link, you'll be further guided to the many, many other connections to anything 100. Historical overviews and the battalion challenge resources will be available on this page. Like the battalion resource link, when you click on the link to the challenge resources, you will find all of the information that you will need about the challenge. You'll find the, the, the project overview, the research final form, as well as the permission media approval form, and the presentation template, the recommended template. Although we hope you've been provided with everything and more than you will need with these couple of website pages and documents, please feel free to connect via email with these three points of contact.
Ms. Janice Sakoda, Ms. Sherilyn Lau, and myself, Sheila B. Now that you've experienced the stories of some of the men of the 100th, heard about the challenge, the expectations, and been exposed to the website and pages full of both battalion and challenge rate resources. Once you've signed up to, the, to participate, the next step is to connect with the battalion mentors and volunteers. Your first meeting will happen during the first week of April 4th. We'll be asking each participant for two to three available dates and times, and this will allow us to match you up with an available mentor. From there, you'll be able to continue to connect throughout the challenge. We presented you with a lot of information and this concludes the formal portion of this meeting. Mahalo and aloha for joining us tonight as we launch the 100th Infantry Battalion Challenge. If there are any questions for the battalion organizer, or the challenge contributors, please unmute yourself and or put your questions in the chat for us to address. So if there's any questions, please feel free to just go ahead and unmute yourself or put them in the chat. So as you organize your thoughts, I do wanna leave you with a couple of important dates for you to note down and remember. Met the first mentoring meeting is April 4th. The research form basically will be provided and be required to be done by the time you do your project turn in, which is the week of May 9th, and your presentation the week of the 16th. Are there any questions in the chat? See any? And Carolyn has put the um, the event break registration as well as the website URL for everyone to note down. And again, you can always check in with us as well. No questions. Any comments? Comments. So if you don't have any now, feel free to get with the points of contacts. If you have any um, questions or insights about the 100th uh, Infantry Battalion, please get with Janice via that email. And of course, if you have questions, you can get with uh, Sherilyn and myself via these emails. Is there a limit to the number of students involved? involved? No, no number. Um, if you have a class, say you're a teacher and you have a class of however many, 10, 15, 30, um, you can do it as a class project, that's up to you, um, or you can do it as separate groups. It just, we want to make this as easy as possible, as easy as possible. So if you have an idea and it doesn't sound like it fits in, it probably does, one. So just get with us and we'll be happy to get with you and, and talk through it and see and make sure that it's in line with the statement, right? The challenge statement, that's, that's the biggest thing. Is it a problem? It, does it connect passion and values and all of those things from the hundredth that you've learned from? And then of course the presentation to be able to do that. And we have another question. Uh, could we ask questions by phone? Definitely go ahead and email me and I'll, be able to send off my my phone number to you as well everything's possible here any other questions um there's a question from a mentor who wants to know if they just check the website or if there'll be meeting uh meeting just for the mentors as well i that is going to be dependent upon uh what's going on with the participants. Right now, we're trying to feel it out. Um, so there might be a mentor all gathering, um, or it might be a one-on-one -on -one or one to a couple people, and we'll just kind of feel it out, whatever the need is. But 
uh, between the organizers and the challenge coordinators will uh, will make sure that everybody's communicating with in a timely manner. I hope that answered it. Or did I evade a question again, Kathy? <laughs> this is Kathy. I, I think um, we will reach out to the mentors. They won't have to go into the website to see if they were selected. Uh, we will reach out to them uh, when it's time, correct? Thanks for the clarification. Yes, definitely. Much clearer, thank you. Uh, another question, what is the difference between a volunteer and a mentor in terms of how we help? I'll try to take this and other people can chime in as well. Um, the mentor is more of a guide to the participant or student or class or whoever you get assigned to, where you, um, you provide guidance on moving from, from the statement to an idea, to the actual selection of the solution, to presentation. So you're, you're there to provide guidance to get to a solution and help them through presentation. A volunteer is more of a person that we would ask to share their story or share a bit of history about either a family member or something that is of interest in regards to battalion historical data um, or the men's activities or stories or more stories that would help um, our participants. So if there's any kind of questions about historical need or knowledge or activity or timelines, then we would reach out for a volunteer to give that discussion or have that discussion with whoever's reaching out. Yeah, or provide that historical perspective. So I hope that covers what a mentor is. A mentor is a lot more involved in just in, ge in generic uh, journey and the, the volunteer is more of a resource of historical perspective about the hundredth, the men, the family, the stories, activities. Any other questions? You're welcome, Karina, you're welcome. Students have any questions or comments? So as you know, we are available for questions um, and just get with us and we'll make sure that our information is on the website as well. Um, uh, and you'll be able to find us just, I think, by just Googling this whole event, you'll find someone to connect with and they can connect us back to you if for some reason you don't have these emails. So the hope is to have this video or this recording completed within a day or two and put up on the website for anybody that hasn't been here or wants to review it or anything like that. Awesome. Sheila, we should also say that there's a lot of other stories that weren't, we didn't have time for on, on this Portion, so it'll be up on the website also. There's going to be a lot of resources on that website, a lot of links, a lot of books, and just a lot of things that you can use, um, as well as the volunteers might be able to guide you, right? If you have a question and somebody has a special niche or knowledge, then that connection will be attempted to be made. Any other questions? Well, that, that really concludes the, the whole launch portion. Um, and again, any questions or anything that you think, wow, that would be really cool to do, but that doesn't sound like what they were thinking, get with us because we're open to anything. Uh, the organizers uh, just wanna share this wealth of knowledge and 
the hundredth bravery and the values and all, they just want to get it out there. So we're, we're really flexible.